Um, let me see. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I have a very small detail to discuss. That's why I start from far away and <clears throat> discuss some general aspects. Uh, so we are talking about uh, uh, privation, what I call privation, and also its connection with negation. So <clears throat> you can negate several different things. You can negate action, existence, possession, or identity. And uh, languages do this very differently. So we have here some examples from two well-known languages, Finnish and Latin, how differently they exist, uh, e express these uh, things. Uh, uh, but then <coughs> many languages use the same word or verb, like uh, copula existential to, to express uh, existence and also negation, but some languages have a special negator of identity. So I took Mongolian as an example. So you have this, uh, if you uh, denote, de deny the identity of a, of a nominal object, then you use a different negator, right? not that one, so in Mongolian. But I'm not going to discuss that. Uh, I want to uh, find out what we can call carative or privative constructions. So um, simple negation is certainly not uh, privation. Uh, there is no aspect of absence of existence. In Finnish, you can make a distinction between two types of sentence. Uh, the existential sentence, which would be tässä ei ole kirja, there is no book here, or tässä ei ole kirja, which means it is not the book that is here. So in the second example, um, you deny the identity of the object and you use the verb uh, to be as, a, uh, equ as an equitive verb while in the first example you have it as an existential verb. So this is because Finnish uses this verb in, in several different functions. Uh, <clears throat> so what I call privation is uh, the negation of existence or the negation of possession. And these are also, as you know, expressed in different ways in different languages. So in Finnish, uh, the negation of uh, possession uh, takes place in exactly the same way as the negation of existence. But uh, we have here Mongolian, which has uh, several different ways to negate possession. Uh, so, uh, and I'm not going to analyze these uh, or gloss these examples, but uh, uh, many of you will know Mongolian. So, so you can uh, uh, say, I have a book. You can say not at nom B. There is a book at my place, at me. Or you can, instead of this B, you can use a regular verb not at nom B. And, uh, but you can also say P nom te, which would be I'm with a book. I'm someone with a book. And interestingly, in, in a Mongolia, at least, you can, you can have this. Uh, uh, a very special construction, not at nom te, which means uh, at my place there is with book. Uh, and I'm not sure if this can be used in the negative uh, counterpart. Maybe Benjamin will immediately can say if this is grammatical in Inner Mongolia, not at nom que. But uh, uh, these uh, constructions have also, also their negative counterparts. And these are what I call privative constructions. So we have three terms. We have this carative, which is used in this conference, which comes from Latin carere, to lack. Uh, we have also abessi, which is used often of cases, as in the Finnish language, there is an abessi case. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> for some reasons, I prefer the term privative, which is used uh, for many types of absence of uh, something from Latin privare, to deprive. 
Uh, and I understand that there are simple, simply differences between different traditions, like in Finno Greek and Caucasian studies, where people often use the term karity, but I think in Mongolian studies, we nowadays prefer the term privative. Uh, and uh, I'm mainly focusing on the languages of the Ural Altai type, which have very fe many features in common. And uh, I made a list of what I think are the structural options for privative constructions in Ural Altai languages. So you have uh, uh, both analytic and synthetic uh, types of expression, and you can express privation by preposition, by postposition, by case marking, also pleonastically preposition plus case marking. You can have uh, different types of derivational forms, uh, denominal, deverbal, and uh, you can then use this existential words, existential nouns or verbs, uh, and some of these can be suffixalized, uh, as we already saw in Mongolian in the paper by, uh, in the previous paper. But I'm actually uh, going to talk about this uh, uh, type 10, which is uh, what I call denominal privative verbs. But before I come to them, I will have to discuss the other types. And there is another parameter, this uh, uh, syntactic status of these expressions what position they take in the sentence. They can be used adverbally, ad nominally, or ambivalently in both, uh, fun, uh, both positions, or they can have independent use, or as you also called it, headless use, headless nouns and headless or independent verbal use. So, so uh, we have here, the first four types from well-known languages, Finnish and Hungarian. So in Finnish, uh, normally today, we would use a uh, uh, preposition, for instance, ilman kirja, without the book. Uh, and this uh, preposition requires a certain case, which is the partitive case. Uh, we could also use this uh, as a postposition, but that's not so common in modern Finnish. In Hungarian, you would use nelku as a postposition, uh, but in older Finnish, you can use also the abusive case, which is a, uh, <coughs> an, a regular case of the nominal paradigm, kirjatta, without the book. This is also called in the Finnish grammatical tradition, the carative case, uh, no, the abusive case, but it, it corresponds to the definition of carative. Um, in Estonian, we have the same construction. Ramatuta uh, would be without a book, but you can combine it with a preposition. So you can also say ilma ramatuta, without a book, without a book. Um, and uh, while in Finnish and Hungarian, these prepositional and postpositional constructions are used only adverbially in Estonian, you can also use these constructions as in the adnominal position. So you can say, Ilma Ramatutta Mees, a, a man without a book, uh, which is different from Finnish. Uh, okay, it doesn't go. Okay, uh, the same type we have in uh, Turkish or Turkic languages, we have this imperative or privative suffix. So, uh, like goes uh, I, goes without an I. You can use it both ad nominally and adverbally. As you see in these examples, like Gusus Balak, uh, uh, an eyeless fish, or Gusus Guriorum, I'm seeing without eyes in adverbial use. Uh, so, in Turkish, uh, we wouldn't call this a case suffix, we would call it the privative derivational marker, which has uh, both adnominal and adverbial uses. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in a language like Finnish, we had this abusive case, but to make this abusive form usable in adnominal position, you have to uh, derive 
uh, an abdominal form from it. So you, you, we have this form which are in Finnish grammar is called carative derivatives. So kadetun or the stem is kadet the man. So handless person. And from this you can again derive an adverbal form like kadet the master in a handless way, uh, which is more or less the same as kadetta with the abusive case. Uh, the same applies to Hungarian. So we have case talent, handless, and case talent in a handless way. Uh, but many Ural Altaic languages use a different strategy, and this is what we have also in Mongolian. Uh, for some reason, there, it's very common to have a noun expressing absence or absence. So, uh, we have this in Samoyedic, in Nanasan, we have this Janku, uh, which is really a noun which you see from its uh, inflection. So, you can add a personal suffix which makes it a predicate, like Jangum. But it means simply, I am absent. It has no verbal element. It's a real noun. While in some other Semitic languages, like Tunda Nenets, has derived from this stem an actual verb, which is then a privative verb, like Tunda Nenets Yango, which means to be absent. Uh, but uh, in general, I think, at least in the Eastern realm of Ural Altaic, uh, uh, these nominal expressions of absence uh, <coughs> prevail. And you have this in Turkic, in the verb yok, or in chuvas sok, which we already heard about. Uh, and in Mongolian, this uh, uge. Uh, <coughs> I think it should be phonemized away, uvi in the modern language. Uh, then we have evenki archin which is clearly noun because um, it also has a plural form, archi. And in the Nanai group, we have this Abba, which is a noun, and Manchu has Aku. Um, some of these nouns are actually of verbal origin. So I think that Turkic yok or yok is actually a, a de-verbal noun. This is also proposed by Marcel Erdal in, her, in his um, monograph on Turkic derivation. And maybe Mongolic uge is also ultimately a, a, a de-verbal noun. But uh, synchronically, all of these are nouns. And uh, as we already heard, this uh, uge can be added or suffixized to a, a nominal word which makes it what I think is more like a clitic and not a suffix. One reason is that it, as we heard, uh, <clears throat> does not confirm to vowel harmony. So it, uh, it is a front or female vocalic suffix, irrespective of the harmonic status of the preceding stem. Uh, and a very similar construction we have also in Tungusic, like in, in this is Hamnigan Evenki, Murina Archin or Murina Archin uh, without a horse. Uh, this is, uh, this Archin here, it's a noun, but it's used postpositionally and in a very similar way as in Finnish we had this Ilman, because in Evenki this construction also contains the partitive case. Uh, but it's becoming very similar to the Mongolic construction in which the privative element is becoming a clitic. Uh, we already heard in the previous lecture about this, that there is a, a more or less a harmonic uh, uh, correlation between privative and possessive constructions. So, we have this third uh, way without a card, and we have the corresponding possessive construction tereqte. I consider these both cases in modern Mongolia, uh, but they, they are cases which can be used both ad nominally and ad verbally. Uh, so they are uh, somewhat different from most other cases, which mainly are used either ad verbally or 
or ad nominally. There is an interesting uh, type of construction which has no direct relevance to my discussion, but I mention it here. So you can uh, use this possessive and probably also the privative uh, form uh, in existential sentences like this. It is windy here. What you actually say, it is with wind or here with wind there is. So this is an existential sentence, but it uses this uh, uh, possessive form. You might think that it would be enough to say and self by their wind is, but uh, <coughs> for some reason the possessive form is pre <coughs> preferred here. And uh, as we already heard also, this uh, privative element can be added to nominalized verbs and then it's no more, no longer a privative element, it's a negative uh, uh, element, so it negates verbal forms. And this is the standard way to negate verbs in modern Mongolian. So you say, Yapsung, he went, and Yapsung went, he did not go, which means etymologically, without his going. But it's used already as a regular predicate as a finite form. And we have a very similar expression in Manchu, this with aku, gunaraku, will not go. And interestingly, this system or structure is also copied to Kazakh, which is a Turkic language. So in uh, Turkic, uh, you would normally use this uh, negative uh, derivational form, so like Kelgen, he went and came again, he did not go. That's the old way of saying negation in Turkic. But in Kazakh, you can also say Kelgen emes, which is with using by using the, the auxiliary to be. So uh, he was not one who went. But you can also use the Mongolian construction, construction Kelgen Zok, which means uh, there is not his having gone. So he did not go. This is an exact copy of the Mongolian construction, which is, I think, interesting. But then we come to this type 10, which are verbs which contain a, a privative element. Uh, in, this is well known from Turkey. So we have uh, not only the nominal privative sis, but we also have the verbal privative sira. So you can say uh, to lose uh, uh, strength. Uh, uh, and I don't think this sira, this R is anyway, in any way related to this Z. They are both derivatives from this uh, element S. Uh, this type of verbal uh, uh, privatives is also well known from Samoyedi. Like in Tunda Nenet, so you can say Sarsada, uh, one who is blind, so it's actually a parti participle form of a privative verb from a noun. And to make it uh, usable adverbally, you have to use an adverbial derivative. So this is an interesting form. And uh, we have uh, heard some other papers about its origin. I think there is a an alternation between L and J in this form, and maybe it actually derives from a separate verb that was added to nouns, but that's another thing. What, what we now have is my actual theme. So we have a, a few verbs in Mongolic which contain the element S with or without a preceding vowel, which mean to lack something. So we have the noun el, food, and elus, to lack food, that is to be hungry. And in the same way, umdahas, to lack drink, that is to be thirsty. And also at least one third one, this nigul is sin, but niguless means uh, to pity, to, be, to have compassion, which I think can only explain from the idea that you are without Sin. So we have these verbs in which this uh, S uh, 
functions as a privative derivative suffix. I think this come, uh, this s comes from a suffixalized negative uh, verb, which is esse. Uh, and namely, as many of you know, in Mongolic, you nowadays use this uh, negative existential to negate verbal forms. But earlier in classical Mongolic, classical Mongolian, you used uh, uh, prefixed negative particles, one of which was this esse. And this esse also has verbal uses, so you can use it as an echo verb after any other verb in the same form. So yaboku eseku means actually to go, not to go, uh, or to go, not to. Uh, so it has verbal uh, elements and I think uh, it's uh, <clears throat> very similar to what we have in Tungusi, this negative verb, which can also be suffixalized. So there is a tendency to, to suffixalize negative elements. And we have here this uh, example from Hamnikan Evenki. So you can see a simbura. I don't give, but you can also suffixalize it and make it bura sim. In which case the negative verb is has become a suffix to a nominalized verbal form. So obviously this uh, Mongolic esse in all of its uses is very similar to this uh, Tungusic uh, negative uh, negation verb, which is uh, which has the stem e, but it has the aorist stem esse or uh, or esi. Uh, actually, uh, so what remains is to explain why these forms are so similar in Mongolic and Tungusi. Uh, so it can either be a borrowing or a cognate. And of course, uh, we have the Altaic hypothesis, which would automatically say that it's a cognate. But since I don't believe in the Altaic hypothesis, I have to find some other explanation. I have proposed a Hinganic hypothesis, which would mean a distant relationship only between Mongolic and Tungusi. And this is a possibility which gives some uh, points to this uh, idea of cognitive. But you can think of other aspects. So it's a basic vocabulary item which would rather <coughs> uh, not. Uh, uh, which would rather support the idea of cognitive because these are normally not borrowed. On the other hand, uh, we know that negators can be borrowed. In, we have some examples uh, also in, from the Uralic languages, like the Russian ni is borrowed into many Uralic languages. Uh, but then the direction of borrowing is unlikely because normally borrowings were uh, transferred from Mongolic to Tungusic and not in the other dialects. And we also have uh, the verbal features of the Mongolic uh, negative element, which uh, <coughs> look somehow very archaic and might not be easily borrowed. On the other hand, only the stem and the, the aorist element S are only attested in Tungusic, which means that there are some arguments against uh, borrowing. So I don't really know what the answer is. Uh, maybe you can have an opinion on that. So thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, Vlada has a question. please. Yeah, thank you very much. It's very interesting. And uh, I have a question uh, concerning the um, example uh, 10, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's about it's part about uh, the suffix derived according to your uh, explanation from a uh, negative marker. Yeah, uh, last slide after read about this from deriving the suffix from a uh, say, yeah. And I have a question because say is always a prepositional marker. So uh, would you like to describe how it can, make, can be uh, criticized and then um, suffixalized and um, grammaticalized. Uh, 
uh, and um, do you have any um, evidences for for post position of Fase in Mongolia? Uh, no, I don't think there is no other evidence in Mongolic, but uh, if yeah. we associate with it with the Tungusic uh, negation verb, we see that this Tungusic negation verb can also become postpositionalized. That's why I think the same can have happened in Mongolic, and it would have happened rather early because uh, these forms are no longer synchronically transparent. But we also see the general uh, trend to suffixalize negative elements, like also this uge has become a suffixal element. Uh, of course, it was always used suffixally, but uh, I think uh, it's a general trend to suffixalize all grammatical markers. So that's not very particular, I think. Just a quick comment on that. Uh, intermediately, we didn't have a lot of case forms. I mean, you have Essek, Essek, you have Essebel. So you have the uh, conditional form and you have the future participle uh, that look like a verb, but these are the only forms. So you really don't get a full verbal parad paradigm for classical, for a classical stem Esse and much less so in Middle Mongol. So it wouldn't be very old. It would be younger than Middle Mongol. And uh, it's possible that just some uh, auxiliary was lost, like um, a basu with uh, a as an auxiliary. It's more problematic with uh, hu because that would take the other negator, ulu. So yeah, I also don't... yeah, that's possible. But we also have no attestations of this type of full constructions with an auxiliary verb. So you looked that up. We don't have this any attested attested examples of constructions which would contain an auxiliary verb like a ah in this type of construction. So so we don't know how old this these examples with the, uh, with the verbal use of esse in Mongolic really are. But I, I don't know how many forms you, you are saying that there are only two forms. I'm not sure if that's quite so, but we can check how many different forms uh, this esse can have. I think I checked smaller yeah. older corpora but I didn't find more than those two. And if I look at modern data, yeah. um, the other forms are occasionally constructed, but very rarely. So mm. you do find a form like isn, but yeah, uh, yeah. the frequency is extremely low. Yeah, this is not so common construction also, but uh, I think it's very difficult to say anything about its age, but it suggests that this essay can have verbal functions. At least it suggests this possibility. But even if it was not so, we can still continue with this explanation that maybe this esse as a negator was suffixed to nominal verbs and became a suffix for privative verbs.